Awesome. Well, we now have a quorum, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, we, have, we have four of seven commissioners. Um, any additions or modifications to the agenda? Not seeing or hearing anything. Uh, moving on to public forum. And I'll give it to Shannon. Not receive any requests um, for speaking tonight. Um, but I'm happy to, if there's anyone in the public that you'd like to. Absolutely, yes. Anyone in the public uh, or the attendees um, wants to speak for the public forum, please raise your hand. I'm not seeing any hands raised and seeing how, yeah, no public forum. I am going to close that agenda item and I'm going to recess the meeting until 6 p.m. Um, to start the training. So thank you for everyone. Mila, thanks for jumping on to, to let us start the meeting. And uh, we'll see everybody in about 17 minutes. All right, it is uh, 6 p.m., uh, returning from recess. Um, everyone in the public that's uh, joining with us, thank you for joining us. This is the first of four trainings with NACOL. Um, the next three being June 10th, June 15th, and June 17th. Um, and, uh, yeah, so thank you for joining with us. And with that, I'll give the floor to Cameron. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, for allowing us to um, join you tonight um, to talk a little bit about civilian oversight of law enforcement. Um, as you had mentioned, um, this is the first of four trainings um, tonight. This meeting get, is being recorded. Get my screen, this, the presentation up and running here. Can you all see the screen okay? Okay, perfect. So tonight, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about civilian oversight um, in general, more general terms, um, and about the principles for effective civilian oversight. Um, later on, we'll be talking about things like uh, reporting processes, training, um, uh, standards, as well as um, community engagement. And um, we'll wrap things up um, on the 17th with, um, in ad addition to a couple of other things, um, a session where we'll be able to address opportunities and challenges for the commission. Um, so before we begin, I also wanna say, um, I'd rather this be a conversation than us, uh, me talking to all of you for two hours straight. That seems um, like a horrible way to spend the next two hours uh, just being talked to. So um, as we go, if you have questions, please feel free to just speak up and, and ask. Um, I don't mind being interrupted for a good cause. So um, so with that, um, I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about myself. I know I've had the opportunity to meet some of you um, on a meeting before, but my name is Cami McElhenney and I am with, I'm the Director of Training and Education for NACOL. I've been with the organization in one form or another since 1998. I started out as a board member for a civilian review board in Indianapolis, Indiana, in 1998, and I served on that board for six years. And one of the things um, that I realized is uh, that I was appointed to a board that I knew the purpose of, but I had no idea how much I didn't know um, when I started. And so I have worked very hard over the last, I guess, uh, over what, 23 years now to make sure that boards and commissions and oversight agencies in general have the training that they need to be able to perform the mandates that they've been um, asked to, to carry out. So now I'd like to hear a little bit from all of you. Um, so we tend to ask, um, since we're gonna be spending eight hours together talking about this and probably a little bit of time after that as well, um, 
I just wanted to learn a little bit more from all of you by asking a couple of questions. First of all, why you wanted to be, and I'm sorry that says PCRB, um, but why you wanted to be a part of the Burlington Police Commission. And then also, what do you, what do you hope to get out of the training process? And I asked that second question because um, I have easily have, I could talk to you for eight hours about all things civilian oversight, um, but I wanna make sure that we also talk about the things that really will help you in the work you're doing. So um, if, if someone wants to start um, um, answering those two questions, we can just kind of do a, a, a popcorn style that works for you. <clears throat> Just jump on in. Yeah, I'll start. Um, I'll start with uh, the, uh, the first one here. Why do you want to be a member of the Brother Police Commission? Um, I joined in response uh, to an incident that happened that involved some of my some of my close friends. And as a 30 plus year resident, I found it unacceptable and wanted to see how I, I could affect change and tr and make sure that like, A, this wouldn't happen again. And, and yeah, just kind of make sure this wouldn't happen again and just be more involved with the process and see how it works. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, this is uh, uh, Commissioner Grant, Milo Grant. Um, very similar experience. Um, that our chairman just described, um, just some things that happened that just really hit close to home. And um, Burlington's an amazing place, an amazing community. And it, it, it talks a really good talk, but it doesn't always walk the walk. Um, our city's currently facing multiple lawsuits. And I just wanted to be a part of, of change. Um, and what I hope to get out of this is to have an understanding, because as we're currently set up, we really can't, we're not really an oversight body. We, we can bring up things, but there are times where we're ignored, we refuse access to information, um, how can we improve that? How can we uh, reimagine an oversight body, uh, create something new? What would be the best practices, et cetera? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Stephanie Seguino. I joined the commission for similar reasons, partly um, also related to work that I had done previously with regard to racial disparities in policing in Vermont. And um, hopefully being able to offer some of my data skills to the commission, but also to really wanna participate as a citizen in uh, rethinking public safety in a way that I think is maybe more modern in the sense that, uh, you know, a lot has changed in the last 15 years with regard to our understanding of brain science, trauma, uh, restorative justice, and many other, you know, mechanisms for public safety. And so I was hoping to be part of that conversation and to, as I said, lend my skills to any extent I could. Hi, Cami. I'm Shireen Hart. So I've been on the commission for five years. I've got one year left of my second term. And I joined it back five years ago when they were just wrapping up, the police commission had just done an extensive look at response to mental health crises. And that was what interested me because of some of the work I do has to do with uh, mental health agencies and hospital EDs and responses to mental health crises and how often the police are involved. So that was what got me interested and made me apply. What I'm hoping to get out of this is the, one of the big issues with something like the police commission is we have tremendous turnover. So for example, I'm the last one at this point from, but well, it, there's tremendous turnover. And so it's very hard to have systems in place. For example, I've noticed people calling in with issues about mental health crises 
and we they did such a deep dive six years ago into that but we just there's there's very little historical um knowledge or or memory for what we do i also think we don't want to continue doing what we've done because we're largely responsive and you know responding to things and it would be great to develop practices that we can document that so that you know if there are five new seven new people in this position in three years they at least will not have to reinvent the wheel which it, it does feel like we're doing I, I have no doubt in my mind that we are making improvements and that um, just this year alone there's been tremendous improvement but I'd like to see us just um, have something where we can folks who are new to the commission don't feel uh, like probably Stephanie and others have felt when they join, which is just, <laughs> it's like a minefield learning what we do. Could I uh, add to this question about what I hope to learn? Yeah. Something, things have changed also, and that is that um, the, the role of the commission had not been entirely clear, I would say, but increasingly, especially since the murder of George Floyd and events last year here in Burlington, there's increased uh, interest and I would say demand for greater civilian oversight over policing. And there's some question as to whether the police commission is the body to do that and whether we need a, a different body to provide some of that. And really to be able to fulfill our role and, and to the extent that there's a desire uh, by the city to expand it. We really need to understand deeply what, what are the possibilities of civilian oversight? What do some of the structures and policies look like? Uh, so it's, I, I think it's really helping us do our jobs better of civilian oversight as we gain more responsibility, which we have been gaining. Great, thank you for that addition. Any anybody else want to contribute, Shannon? So um, I will say, so hearing all of those um, all of those answers, I want you to know that you're not alone in that. Um, that some of the issues that you have faced, some of the things that you're feeling about the process are things that we see in other cities, particularly as they work towards more effective me mechanisms. Um, and, um, and I'm hoping that some of the things that you talked about today that are seen at this moment as challenges, that some of the training that we're gonna do in the next sessions um, and today will lead those, lead you to a way that you can look at those challenges as also opportunities. Um, and, and so I'm hoping that, that, um, that we can keep all of those in mind. I, I took some notes, I'm sure you could tell as you're speaking just generally not attributing it to any in particular person, but I think all of those are very valid. And maybe we'll um, talk a little bit more about how we can incorporate some more of those things in, in our discussions going forward. Yes. Amy, I noticed that um, a member of the public, there were two hands at one point. Did Sorry. you want to yeah. Sorry, I think we're going to keep this discussion amongst the commission. Okay, so uh, we should just make that. Yep. Yeah, we should just let the public know what our approach will be. So, because I did see a couple of hands up. So, um, so I guess what we can invite folks to do is, depending on what they hear today, there will be public comment at the beginning of each of these sessions. Is that correct, Jabu? Correct. And Ken? Yep. Okay, so that would be the opportunity. Okay, sorry to interrupt. No worries. Thank you. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to move on into the training itself. So today, what we're going to cover today are civilian oversight and law enforcement and some, some general information about its history, models, and an overview of some oversight mechanisms in the United States and how they operate so that you can have some information on what, what it looks, what oversight can look like. Um, and then also we're going to spend some time talking about principles for effective oversight and also what do we mean when we say effective oversight. 
So I, um, I like to start presentations with this slide because I think that a lot of times, um, particularly when oversight is established in a city following um, a critical incident um, that has occurred in, in the community, people say, if we have civilian oversight and we have subpoena power or something else, everything will be fixed. And the thing is, is that civilian oversight is important. And I must say subpoena power when you get it is important. Um, but there, there are some other things, you know, how a community works to deal with a lack of trust between the public and law enforcement is very important. Um, the most successful solutions include a collection of reform efforts and restructuring that impact law enforcement directly. And increasingly, it's been shown that civilian oversight is a very important piece of that whole process. So really, although there are many things that must be put into place to reform, over, reform policing, um, build trust, and many things need to happen to make all of that fall into place, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to do it without civilian oversight. That community non-sworn involvement is critical to this process. So a little bit about civilian oversight and how we define it. So broadly, civilian oversight can be defined as the independent, external, ongoing review of law enforcement um, and its operations by individuals outside of the sworn chain of command. Um, civilian oversight can entail, but is not limited to independent investigation of complaints. And I say <laughs> not limited to, because we do have a lot of civilian oversight entities in the United States that this time review complaints that are, are investigated internally in a department. Um, but it can also involve auditing and monitoring various aspects of the overseen law enforcement agency, analyzing patterns or trends and activity, um, issuing public reports and issuing recommendations on discipline, training, policies and procedures. Taken together, these these, all of these functions can produce um, or, or promote greater law enforcement accountability, increased transparency and a and positive organizational change and improve responsiveness to communities needs and concerns. Um, and, and I know that of all of those string of words that I just said, really transparency and accountability and responsiveness to the community are three very key points in all of that. Kenny, can I ask a question? I'm gonna take you at your word. You don't mind being interrupted. So um, that, I believe that the stage that we are at is with regard to not investigating um, mm -hmm. in incidents or use of force, but reviewing. But mm -hmm. I wonder if you could describe what you mean by reviewing, what that would entail what, we, in terms of decisions, inputs, and so forth. Yes. So when I'm talking about reviewing um, investigations that are done internally, that means when a Conduct, when an allegation of misconduct is made by a member of the community, the complaint is forwarded on to uh, internal affairs um, so that they can do a thorough investigation of that complaint and come to a decision on whether it's sustained, not sustained, unfounded, um, depending on what your dispositions are. Um, some cities do it a little differently than others. Um, and then, so then once that investigation is done, typically what happens is that then the investigation and all of the elements that the, the law enforcement agency had um, to make the decision that they made are then forward on to a review board so that they can review that information as well and see if they feel that the investigation was done adequately, if they would come to the same decision to see if there needs to be a further investigation. Um, and in some cases, um, some cities do have the authority to then ask for an independent investigation be done if they feel that the investigation was done inadequately. Um, so does that help answer your question? Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Kim, Kimmy, can I ask a yeah. question? Mm -hmm. How often do you, well, 
how typical is it for the investigates on the um, on the incidents to be in the same entity that's conducting the monitoring and the input on policies and procedures? Is that typically the same body that's doing those in, in, in what you're seeing or, or do cities or communities tend to separate those? So, so what, and when we get to the conversation about models of oversight, we can, I'll be able to explain this a little bit more, but what happens is that we see there are investigatory agencies that do investigations independently, but as a result, they often also are able to do data analysis and recommendations um, because they're doing all of this. They, they tend to, if they've been given investigative authority, they tend to also have some additional authorities that maybe a just the typical run of the mill um, review board might not have. Um, I would say that in what we are seeing is a trend in review boards getting more authority to do things like data analysis, policy recommendation, um, recommendations for procedures, training, um, and then also doing systemic reviews as well. All of those things are things that we're seeing written in to new ordinances for just review boards that we had not seen in the past. Normally, we saw those types of things with an auditor monitor model or with an investigative model. So although there are still a lot of review boards out there that might not have it, that is the trend that we're seeing, particularly, I would say, everything that we have seen established in the last nine months has, has had that kind of authority attached to it. Great, that's really helpful, thank you. So one of the other things about civilian oversight is that because it's an independent and neutral body, oversight of law enforcement offers a, a very unique opportunity um, to build legitimacy and bring transparency to what's an often very opaque process. Um, because oversight agencies operate outside of the overseen law enforcement agency and report to local stakeholders, um, the findings and reports of an oversight agency are free from real or perceived bias. So it really does help build, that's, that's the piece that builds that legitimacy um, is because people, whether it's real or perceived, find bias often in the reports that are coming out of the police department and so, and, and an investigation of their own. And this helps add an element to it that kind of that check to the whole process. So move on to the next screen. So a few facts about the field. So um, there are nearly 200 civilian oversight entities across the United States. So I will say in 2019, <clears throat> Excuse me, in 2019, there was um, a study done where they looked for, they verified, tried to verify the number of civilian oversight agencies in the U.S., and they came up with 167 verified civilian oversight agencies. Um, these were agencies that were established through ordinance. They were part of the, or part of the city charter. Um, they weren't advisory boards. And so we do feel like that number might have been a little low, but we do know that by the time we get to 2020, we were closer to 200. And since June of last year, just NACO alone, and I know we're not the only ones talking to communities, NACO alone has talked to over 130 new communities looking to establish civilian oversight. So we are seeing incredible growth in the field. And what we're also seeing is that communities like yourself are looking to find out more about what effective civilian oversight looks like so that they can make sure that what they're putting in place is effective and sustainable um, and can make a difference because in the end, um, that's what everybody is looking to do. Um, so one of the, um, and Stephanie, I think you'll probably um, appreciate this or be frustrated by this as well, since you um, are, you like the research part of it, is that no two civilian oversight entities are alike, which make them very difficult to compare. Um, so, <clears throat> and that comes about because people put together civilian oversight of law enforcement entities based on the needs of their community. 
And then we also know that many communities start way up here with the authorities that they think that they need to make this right. And, and it's not just that they think that they need. Um, you know, through their research, they have this as their goal. And then there's the compromises that happen and maybe a few things get knocked off the list or done a little differently. And then you end up with, with something a little different. So everything's a little, all of the oversight entities have their, their little um, quirks or differences um, that make them very specific to the city they're operating in. One of the things that we're also seeing is that traditionally we saw civilian oversight mainly in large cities. Um, in the top 10 cities in the country, there's only one that has no civilian oversight. And we're crossing our fingers that Phoenix does something in the near future. Um, but um, what we're seeing in the last decade is that small um, and medium-sized cities are really jumping on board, realizing that this is something that benefits the community as a whole. So we're seeing a lot more growth in that area. And then also, traditionally, back when oversight really was in its new phase, um, getting started in the United States, um, it was often it often happened in reaction to a very specific incident of police misconduct. Now that still happens. However, we're also seeing um, more proactive. Um, establishment of civilian oversight in the country. People and cities or jurisdictions are saying, let's get something in place before we need something. Let's fix some of these problems that we know exist before they end up in tragedy. So I, I, I am happy to report that there are cities out there looking to either establish or enhance existing mechanisms because of that. So why, why do we have oversight? What are some of the, the reasons? Well, first of all, I mentioned before, it builds bridges between um, community and police. Um, there are very few mechanisms that we see that have that ability to do that other than oversight. And one of, that is, one of those reasons is because community engagement, which we will address in depth in one of our later sec sections, um, really, is one of the key elements of an oversight entity. Also, it ensures greater accountability. It helps limit the city's risks that come about when misconduct is not um, being taken care of or goes unchecked. Um, mechanisms should be put in place where good policing is rewarded and support is given to uphold good practices and constitutional policing. So it's not all about saying everything needs to be changed. There are things that are in place that could be working. There are officers out there that are doing good jobs. And so it also, in addition to making reforms to make policing better, it's also looking at policing and those officers who are doing good work and, and recognizing that. It increases public confidence and trust in the police. And by giving civilians a means to address police misconduct and bring transparency to the process, you're helping to protect their rights and those all those that come after them. So the next couple of slides are about common goals of civilian oversight. So you need to make sure that people feel really comfortable and safe accessing the complaint process. So that often means um, if the only mechanism to file a complaint is to go to the police department, that is possibly causing a problem and making people feel uncomfortable with actually making a complaint. Um, we also suggest that people allow anonymous complaints. Now, I realize anonymous complaints are difficult because when you go to investigate them, if you have no information about the person who's making the complaint, the investigation may be limited. However, there has to be the acknowledgement that people sometimes do not feel safe in making a complaint or are very concerned about any retaliation that might occur because of the complaint that's being made. And so having that option provides a safe option for some. Um, and also making sure that they can fi file the complaint, like I mentioned before, without fear of retaliation and making the process as uncomplicated as, process, as possible is very important. 
So are there multiple points of access? Can they file a complaint online? Can, are there some uh, oversight entities have satellite locations where they partner with community stakeholders to allow complaints to be filed? Say, you know, if, if there is a community health center where a lot of people are going in and out and they feel safe there because they know the environment, then maybe that's a great place to have them be able to file a complaint. So thinking about some of those access issues are really important. Um, I, Kimmy, if, I just, if, if it's not a problem, I'm just thinking about this issue of accessibility of complaints. Mm -hmm. I'm much newer to the commission, so I'll just rely on my fellow commissioners. But I understand we have an online complaint system. We also have a community in which uh, many languages are spoken. And so I'm not sure maybe if Shireen or Jabu or Nilo can tell, say if we have other mechanisms other than the online accessibility uh, approach. Yeah, so Stephanie, um, we've always encouraged folks to be able to come to commissioners directly, right? If they would rather have a buffer mm -hmm. um, so they could report to the commissioner and the commissioner could file the report. We also did what Cami just suggested, which is, I think it was about a year or two years ago, Jabu, if you were still on, if you were on the commission, then we can know when it was. But what we did is we took this complaint um, and we delivered them throughout the city to the, exactly what you're saying, to the high school, to various entities, Great. so that we just, we put packets out there for this very reason. But we do have issues. I'm not sure what happened with translating. I can't recall that, but I could certainly look into it. But we would need to update it anyway, Stephanie, because that was, you know, who knows where those are at this point, especially with the new high school. I also do remember yeah, there are, are, my apologies, Mila, you can go. No, it's, uh, go right ahead. Okay. Um, I also, uh, there are, there were like Dropbox locations uh, for complaints. I know there's one at the Boys and Girls Club oh. and a couple other places. Though I don't know the status of those since the pandemic started, um, but yeah. Great. Yeah, some of the feedback um, from the consultant who is uh, collecting um, feelings that uh, the community has about public safety, um, some of the feedback that we received at one of the town halls uh, specifically about how to file a complaint I um, I guess my focus was on getting access to the information and getting more details about complaints because those weren't uh, fully coming through at the time but people brought up um, like what was just said translating that you know the online system isn't as convenient or easy as we might think and that people really didn't know, where they could, um, if they couldn't submit it online, where would they go um, to submit something via paper that there wasn't a lot of knowledge about that. Um, so yeah, I think as a commission that we should probably put that on our to-do list to, to review. And I, I don't even know where they all are. So um, that would definitely be something we want on our list to review. Thank you. No, that all sounds great. And I'm so glad that some of those mechanisms are already in place. There are oversight agencies that have their forms translated in an incredible amount of languages um, because so that all of their residents can um, be able to, un to read the forms. Um, but I do realize that gets a little tricky. In fact, some there are some um, agencies who work with the police who also tend to, because they have the money to invest in translator services, um, also have, uh, they use them to access live translators um, and also um, sometimes work with the police to have the forms translated too. And I know the city probably has that available to them as well, but sometimes that's a, a point of partnership that can happen if you're looking for those. So other common goals of civilian oversight. So parting, um, ensuring that investigations are fair and thorough, um, making sure that they were conducted in a proper manner and that the findings are reasonable and consistent 
um, with other similar cases and that discipline is being administered consistently um, is, is not only a common goal of civilian oversight, but a lot of times we talk about, um, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit later in the presentation about, okay, so there are all of these things that oversight does that benefits the community, but it's also important to remember that there are benefits for law enforcement and civilian oversight. There are um, members of law enforcement who feel that discipline is distributed um, and doled out differently depending on who you are and wh what your rank is. And um, having someone also kind of over overseeing or, or monitoring that process and how it's delivered is also um, a common goal. Also, if it's done effectively and in a sustainable manner, it can increase public confidence um, in policing. And, and some of those things, sustainable manner, you know, a commission that, um, kind of is like this, depending on the political will of the time, makes it very hard to build that um, level of confidence. But when it's consistently supported, um, then, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about principles um, of effective oversight, then it can build that confidence. And also, as we've mentioned before, to enhance transparency in policing um, through things like public reporting, um, not only of what the oversight entity is doing, but also you know things that the police department is doing, either on its own or in, in response to the recommendations made by the oversight agency. Some additional goals to improve law enforcement agencies by analyzing patterns and complaints and the other police related data. Um, to improve policies, practices, and uh, training, and also management. Um, we are doing a lot of work to, and, and there are some academics out there doing some work on the role of supervisors in police reform and, um, and about how oversight can also kind of work in that realm too, to help provide um, ways in which supervisors can um, change that culture um, in policing. There also is that piece where oversight can deter officer misconduct. Um, if people feel that their complaint is going, if a complaint is made against them, it's going to be taken seriously and that there will be a transparent, accountable process to that um, misconduct investigation and determination. It can also reduce legal liability for the city. And um, it also can improve public's understanding and police policy. So there are a lot of instances where complaints are made because there is a misunderstanding of the policies that are in place. I mean, no, there is no citizen that spends a lot of time looking at the general orders of, of their law enforcement agency, if they could even find them online, because there are many cities where that seems to be a very uh, a, a secret. Um, that it's difficult to unearth. Um, but, um, but having you as a community, as part of the community engagement, helping under, you know, the community understand those policies and practices, um, the type of training that um, the department receives can also help them understand why things, certain things happen. But it also can also make them understand that certain things are not supposed to happen. They have a full understanding of the policy and procedure and know how things should have happened uh, when things occurred. So the evolution of oversight. So as I mentioned before, oversight originally was very reactive in nature and reactive only. You know, agents were, agencies were created after high profile incidents. You respond to, to complaints. You have to wait for a complaint to come in the door in order for something to happen. Um, normally reviewing policies uh, when, when one or more complaints came in. Um, it in the past has been, um, you know, it emphasizes legalistic rules, emphasizes what can be seen as an adversarial administrative process by some. Um, and relies heavily on deterrence. Well, so there's going to be a reactive piece of oversight that will never go away because there needs to be that piece where you have a, a, an allegation of misconduct come in because you need to have that place where 
community can come to let someone know that what has happened to them and have it investigated. But what we are seeing is that combined with that reactive process, we're also seeing a move towards proactive policing or of oversight, I'm sorry. So this is more about pro exploring problems through investigation, collection and analysis of data, um, identifying underlying issues through things like systemic reviews. One of my favorite examples is about something um, that an auditor in Tucson, um, a former employee of NACL actually as well, was conducting an audit and she noticed that there were a whole bunch of complaints about chokeholds being applied and chokeholds are banned in the city of Tucson. So as she was doing the audit, she also realized that the badge numbers were almost in succession. And which means that they were from probably the same training class. And so she did a little digging and went in and found out that when they were taught about holds, they were taught by an officer who is not a member of the Tucson Police Department, but another law enforcement agency where chokeholds are not banned. Um, and so she was able to see that the whole class was trained as if it was okay uh, that chokehold was something that they could do. And so they were able to retrain them and the complaints nearly disappeared. So that's something that being able to review patterns, um, look at data, are able to do. You're able to find out where the issues are and work to solve them and correct them before something horrible happens. Um, it also focuses on organizational change, not just changing the behavior of one officer, but, but the law enforcement agency as a whole. Something else that we're seeing is that oversight, particularly when it's acting in a proactive manner, builds partnerships with law enforcement. Um, now, I often feel like I have to clarify, that doesn't mean that um, you're working for law enforcement and that you're pals with law enforcement. You are still an agency that is working that you are working for the process. You're an advocate for the process, not necessarily for the community or for law enforcement, but for the process, a fair, transparent, and accountable process. Um, but it also allows to build that partnership so that changes are implemented, there's, that there's a working relationship there, that there is some trust between you and law enforcement and you and the community, and then eventually the community and law enforcement which is that creating bridges piece that we round this out with. So next, I'm gonna go over a little bit about the history of civilian oversight. And I'll do this briefly. I don't, I don't want to, um, this is not the part where I want you all to, to phase out from the conversation while I go on about, um, you know, 1928 and civilian oversight. So but I will start at 1928. And um, so that is when we see one of the first civilian boards formed in the United States. The problem was is that it was formed by the LA um, uh, Bar Association. So it had no actual authority within the city government to do anything other than review complaints and be a place where it could take complaints in. So um, the Co Committee on Constitutional Rights did not last long, but it was kind of that first effort towards building a board that would oversee complaints made against the Los Angeles Police Department. In 1931, things started to kind of pick up because we actually had someone say that there needed to be an outside entity to look at the misconduct that was occurring in within law enforcement. So the Wickersham Commission, which was originally formed to look at the effects of prohibition, it really ended up bringing light to light widespread corruption and unacceptable tactics in policing and said that there needed to be a disinterested party looking into those matters and creating change. 
So after that, although it took some time, we see the first civilian review board that starts to look a little bit like what we see civilian review boards look like today, except that there, um, there really weren't very many civilians on the board. It was a lot of NYPD officers, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead to New York City. So 1948 is actually Washington, D.C. Um, now, the problem with Washington, D.C. is in the, the years that existed, the first incarnation of it, I think 1948 to 1964, they only reviewed 54 cases. And I'm sure you can all imagine that there were probably more than 54 issues or incidents of misconduct that should have been reported and investigated and reviewed during that time. Um, it was seen as weak and ineffectual, and eventually in the mid-1960s was disbanded. Then we have the New York City Civilian Complaint Board, um, which um, was made up of three police commissioners and operated completely within the department. Um, and it was expanded to include citizens in 1966, but then they disbanded it shortly after. In 1958, we have another board that then comes about in Philadelphia. Um, and it was, it was a board of citizens who referred complaints to the police for investigations. So starting to sound a little more familiar to what we know now. Tammy? Yeah. Um, when you say in, in the New York City Commission of Three that it operated entirely within the within the NYPD, what do you we are often accused of being a part of ah. the department. And so I want to get an understanding of what that actually meant when you're saying they were, you know, operating within the department. There was no independence whatsoever. They um were they met in the department, they, um, they were not able to make decisions really in an independent manner. And in that period of time in New York City, they were all seen as friends of the police. Gotcha. So maybe, maybe in the training, we'll talk about how to make sure a commission is perceived as independent. Yes. And or not perceived, but how it actually is independent. What, you know, what one needs to do to assure that. Yeah, well, and I, I will say, yes, we will talk about that as the, to answer your question. And I will say it is very tricky when you're talking about police commissions um, because they often, that is an off, a very common problem because of their mandates so closely align them. Um, Correct, so, because we're working on directives together, right? So that's why I was asking that question about directives and investigations. And I have to apologize. I have to tune out for about 45 minutes, but I'll watch the recording. So I'm going to oh, be... No worries. Sorry. No worries. Um, so in 1969, really, this is only... Um, I mentioned this only because Kansas City, the Office of Citizen Complaints, is the longest continually running civilian oversight entity in the country. The rest of them have been there, been disbanded, they've come back, maybe disbanded again, and this has been continually operating since then. Not uh, long after it was established, we have the Berkeley um, model that was actually voted into place by voter referendum. Um, and that was the first time that it happened. And they also had the authority to independently investigate mis complaints of misconduct. So really, we did not see that before 1973. At the same time, the Detroit Board of Police Commissioners came in on board, and they, um, they have been in existence since 1973. And I will say, we might, um, it might be great to have some uh, connections so that you can talk to some of the members of that commission as well, because they have gone through many incarnations and I think also struggled with that independence piece. Now, how their board is structured is, is a little different. Um, they have, many of their board members are actually elected, um, but um, so they're, they're, they also have that problem with being part of the, the elected officials. Um, but I think that, um, one of the things, whenever you have some issues that you're talking about, I also like to connect over entities with other entities so you don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel as you're working through issues. 
Um, by 1980, there were a whopping 13 civilian oversight entities in existence. But in the next 20, uh, 20 years, um, we added enough to be nearly, or maybe a little bit more than 100. Um, I will say in the 90s, one of the things that happened is that we saw a burst of this auditor monitor model, San Jose, Seattle. Um, there was a, an, an entity that oversaw the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. Um, and so we saw this increase in a model that we really hadn't seen before. Um, and it was often a reaction, a kind of a compromise between this, invest this independent investigation model and a review board model. Um, but, but what ended up happening is that now you have a model that's able to, to be more proactive and do those systemic reviews um, and audits of, of police um, conduct. And now in 2020, as we mentioned before, um, more than 200 oversight entities and adding all the time. So it's a very exciting time in civilian oversight. Um, it's it's it, exciting because a lot of entities like yourself who have been around are now um, getting the ability to perhaps enhance, better understand what the next step looks like. Um, and and solutions to some of the, the challenges that you might have faced. So it's a very exciting time in civilian oversight. So next, we're gonna move on to a little bit about legitimacy authority and civilian oversight models in the United States. So first of all, what shapes legitimacy? So, Primary issue shaping people's views about legitimacy when dealing with the police is whether the police are exercising their authority in fair ways. So when I see that, then that immediately makes me think of procedural justice. You know, is there neutrality in the process? Is there respect? Do people have a voice? Um, do they trust the process? And I think one of the things that's really important in civilian oversight and for law enforcement to understand is that procedural justice is often more important than the legal outcome of an encounter or an experience. It's about whether you have anything to do with the experience that you have become a part of. Do you have a voice in it? Are you being treated fairly um, and with respect? So um, it's about the quality of treatment and it's about the quality of decision-making. Are decisions made fairly and in a neutral unbiased way? So I think that um, when we're talking about building these bridges, one of them very much is about how oversight can help law enforcement be more legitimate in the eyes of the community. But I also don't want to leave out the fact that it's important for the civilian oversight entity to build legitimacy within the community. It's imperative because you have a very important role to, to play and people have to trust in the authority that you've been given. And that also is very much a part of the procedural justice piece. So when we're talking about legitimacy, we also start to talk about, so what are those types of authority? So you have your statutory authority, you know, local ordinances, state and, law, state and federal laws, um, and that authority is grounded in, you know, it's reaction, it's authority-driven, authority problem-driven, um, focus on accountability and, and discipline or punishment. Um, and it's really about command and control. What is the lawful use of that authority? Um, and measuring numbers as a result. So statutory um, authority is very important because you need to be given the authority in a way that it can't be taken away from you. Um, you need to have, particularly for oversight, you need to make sure that you have the tools and that you're able to use them. But there's also this other piece, the legitimacy-based authority, which is really about community ex expectations and values. Um, it's about, uh, it, it looks at a proactive approach. It looks at, um, it's often done through community outreach and engagement, and it's 
again, about the quality of the process is as important as the outcome. And it's not just about numbers and results. It's about success. What is what are the successes that we're having? And that builds that sense of legitimacy. So I think something else to talk about at this point is what is legitimacy in policing? So are the police trustworthy, honest, concerned about the well-being of the people that they are dealing with? Um, should police authority be accepted? Should people voluntarily accept police decisions and follow police directives? Should they comply with the law and co cooperate with the police? If all you get to a yes on all of those questions, when there is legitimacy in place. And the problem comes when that legitimacy doesn't exist. But also what's legitimacy and oversight? So um, is the agency, it's very similar to the policing. Is the agency trustworthy, honest, and concerned about the people they're dealing with? Um, should their authority be accepted? Should um, people accept oversight agencies' decisions and recommendations? And should they comply with the law and cooperate with the oversight agency? And, and the way you get to yes on all of those questions is through the building of legitimacy um, by having a trustworthy, neutral, fair process. And I also think to go back to something that was asked earlier, I think as you're building that piece, that independence piece, I think legitimacy really plays into that. Um, if they see the oversight entity as a legitimate um, entity, then that helps to build that trust because you're seen as um, moving away from being for the law enforcement agency and being someone that is for the process. So now that we've talked a little bit about legitimacy and authority, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the models. Now, we can, um, if you want to go more into these models at a later date, we can absolutely do that. But I wanted to make sure that you had a basis of information about the types of oversight that exist. So first we have the review focus model, which all of you are very familiar with. Um, so it, it, one of the biggest pieces um, of the review model is that it allows community to be part of the process. Um, it allows them to give input into the complaint investigation process. It allows the community to review investigations and that may increase trust by the public in the process itself. And an individual or a board or a commission authorized to review completed inv internal investigations can agree or disagree with those findings, which means that there can be a point where there is a voice given when there isn't agreement. So moving on to an auditor monitor focus model, um, it involves a full-time civilian, or, well, let me back up a little bit. Full-time civilian investigators <clears throat> and auditors, monitors, they may have highly specialized training and they, and they should. They, should. they shouldn't come into it not, without knowing what it looks like to go through data, to analyze it, and to come to conclusions. Um, Often, and I apologize, I think that these are, um, I'm reading through this, and I think the second box here is really about the investigative model. Um, so let's just pretend that at the top of that box, it says investigative model. Um, so investigations are conducted by people outside of sworn law enforcement. Um, the agency doesn't rely on the investigators at all within the police department, but they do have to rely on complete unfettered access to information and documents, whether it is statements from witnesses, whether it's uh, body cam footage, whether it is um, uh, dash cam footage, the ability to interview officers um, and see all of the reports that were made. Um, it really is important for that um, to be able to be accessible. Um, and civilian, led investigations tend to negate that real or perceived bias that the public often sees when the police are investigating their own. Now, I will say one of the things 
that typically has kept cities from moving to an independent investigative um, model is that, well, first of all, that you tend to talk about independent investigations and law enforcement agencies and unions tend to panic and say, no, thank you, we don't want that. Um, but another part of it is that sometimes smaller communities, it, it's a large investment. Um, it requires, when you're hiring trained investigators, um, you need to have people who do have the training and you need to pay them um, and, and have that enough staff to actually handle that type of work. So it does, it tends to be a more expensive model. But what we are seeing in many smaller communities now is that they're having a review board focused model, help, but they have the ability in their ordinance to send the investigation back for additional investigation, or they, in certain circumstances, can order an independent investigation be done. They can also initiate an investigation on their own if even in the absence of a complaint. So those two things have happened and allowed cities who might not be able to uh, commit to the investment of a full investigative model, they have been able to commit to the, invest the, the investment of having, say, an investigator on contract who could come in when you needed them to. So that's a great, great development in that. Um, a great example is Madison, Wisconsin, just implemented a, a similar a model that did, is exactly that. They also have the ability um, to make policy recommendations and, and analyze data. So moving on to um, what should be the auditor monitor focus model is that, um, yes. Question. So um, just curious, I, that was really interesting to me, this sort of hybrid model with the ability to, so to hire an investigator who would not necessarily be full time. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yes. And what, what typically are the qualifications of a person like that? So, um, no, not necessarily a lawyer, but someone who, sometimes it's former law enforcement who have an investigative background. Sometimes it's people who are private investigators and have that background. Um, there are sometimes that work experience, for instance, someone who might be hired with little experience, say, in a larger agency um, somewhere, who then works for them for a period of time and gains that training and that experience and then goes to a smaller agency who who can't rely on someone who has less experience um, can be brought in. Our next session is actually an entire two hours on um, effective investigative practices and, how, and reviewing. And so the person who is going to be doing that training, um, Jason Wechter, is, um, work, is have been an investigator for over 30 years. He's not an attorney um, and he can probably talk a little bit more about all of the training that's available and should be considered than I could. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, so the auditor monitor models often has many more reporting um, abilities than any of the other models, because what they're doing is they're looking into issues. They're, they're doing audits and they're producing reports which brings so much transparency to the process. Those are public reports that then people can see, first of all, that, that, that those types of things are happening, um, but also um, can see that where the, what the issues are and what the re recommended remedies are to those issues. Um, it may be more effective at promoting long-term systemic change in an agency, a law enforcement agency, um, it's generally, uh, to go back to that cost issue, it's generally less expensive than an investigator model, um, but it does require someone who actually knows how to look at data. Um, it doesn't have to maybe be a certified auditor, although many, if not most of them are, um, and be able to really kind of pull that information together and come up with conclusions. Um, it also, this model also allows the agency to actively engage in many um, or all of the steps of the process. Like there are many auditors who, although they may not be doing the investigation of a complaint, they might be able to sit in um, 
on the interview of um, officers or complainants and ask questions. Or they might be able to submit questions to those doing the interviews. Um, so there are quite a few monitor auditor models who are, do have that ability so that it happens. It's, it's like you're being involved real time that way because then you don't have to wait till you get the investigation and say, well, but why didn't you ask them this? Um, you can be part of that process. Um, and then, um, you know, Stephanie said the word hybrid earlier. Really what we're seeing in most cases now is that most civilian oversight agencies um, are one, they're a combination of one, two or more of, of these models because communities are saying, well, I want this to happen, but I still wanna do this. And we do see that the review piece of this is almost always part of the hybrid because that's the community involvement piece that's so imperative in the oversight process. But then it allows the creation of something that also can do um, an investigation independently or maybe a systemic audit or a systemic review of, of something within the law enforcement agency. So we are seeing that um, that kind of hybridization of, of the models. And I would assume that eventually this presentation um, will change not only to have the correct headings at the top, but also to say that really here's, we have hybrids and this would, these are the components of hybrids. Um, you know, is one model better than the other? Every model has strengths and weaknesses. And so really what, when you're deciding what model to implement, the needs of the community really have to be part of that. You know, what is the history or narrative of the community or communities encompassing the law enforcement agencies? Um, level of support, both financial um, and political for any of these models. Level of authority and independence that's wanted. And what are the expected outcomes? One of the things that I think that, um, particularly when we get to the community outreach piece that you're gonna hear this word expectations a lot. So I'm sure you all know that, you know, you come into the process with expectations, but the community has a whole nother set of expectations about what you should or should not be doing. Um, there, and, and so setting expectations is really important, but also trying to meet some of those expectations um, where they are is also important, particularly when you have the, the ability to establish or enhance an oversight mechanism. I think a lot of times there becomes a point of disappointment um, by communities when they find out that the oversight agency that um, they might have been told is going to fix all of their problems may not have the ability to subpoena witnesses to um, to complete an investigation. It may not have a law enforcement agency that gives them the documents they need to do the work that they're supposed to do. Like there are all of those things that kind of go into that expected outcomes pile that need to also be considered when establishing or enhancing a mechanism. So next, I wanna move on to principles for effective oversight. So I think that given particularly the things that you mentioned at the beginning, I think that this piece may be particularly important to you. So I'm gonna kind of looking at my time, I wanna make sure that I spend the time here that we need and please feel, feel, feel free to jump in with questions. So <clears throat> Nicole recently um, put together the 13 principles for effective oversight. Now I have to say that this was, this is a compilation of pre-existing work and some work that we did working with um, existing civilian oversight agencies based on what stakeholders determined to be most important for the community um, that the agency serves. So this is really, um, it, it identifies the most important aspects of, of oversight. And I, I would be remiss if I did not mention some of the people that helped um, develop principles in the past that we kind of pulled together to make a complete set. So that includes Sam Walker 
includes Joseph DeAngelis, Richard Rosenthal, Barbara Tard, Catherine Olson, some of them oversight practitioners, some of them academics, um, and many others who have really looked at this over the, the last several decades to see what goes into effective oversight. So first on the list is independence, and independence is absolutely key. It cannot be overemphasized enough because all of you know that when the community does not see independence, then that becomes a problem. And that could be a real or perceived issue in some communities. It just depends. But it's one of the most important concepts in civilian oversight. Um, it refers to an absent or a real or perceived influence from law enforcement, political actors, and any other special interests looking to affect the operations of, of the entity. Um, I think an important point um, that we that really has come to light in, in the last several months is that independence is also important because it means you need to have an ability to maintain that independence even um, in the face of high profile events. So, um, you know, there is a critical incident, there's a shooting, there is a death at the hand in, in custody. Um, being able to be seen as independent in even those times is really important. And that goes back to the legitimacy piece because you're there to be part of the process and not necessarily on one side or the other. And believe me, you will be asked by all sides to be on their side, whether it's elected officials or law enforcement or community. And it's about you being independent from those influences and doing the job that you've been tasked with. Um, the next is clearly defined and adequate jurisdiction and authority. So having adequate ju jurisdiction and authority um, are fundamental in achieving organizational goals and ensuring the oversight agency can be responsive to community. So who do you oversee? How do you operate? Um, can you make policy recommendations? Can you, I mean, what are your authorities? And it needs to be very clearly defined. I was looking at um, the, the policy that guides you. And there, when I was going through it, um, I was like, there were lots of, well, who, who does this? Like, you know, who, who determines uh, whether something is low level or mid level? Um, you know, is there, is there a matrix? Like who is in charge of tracking all of this? Um, who's in charge of the spreadsheet? You know, so there are questions like that. And, and it's really important that it's laid out very clearly so that you know that you have the tools that you need and you have a clear idea of what the expectations are of, of you. So if, if as, as you work through your process, um, whatever that might be, keeping that in mind that have those clear definitions and clear authorities is very important in doing the work. The next one is unfettered access to documents, uh, or sorry, unfettered access to records and facilities. So the facilities piece there is because we do have a lot and a growing number of oversight entities that also oversee jails and prisons. Um, and some of those do it in conjunction with patrol. Um, some are just jail and prison, um, but we do, that, that facility piece is very key for them. Um, but unfettered access to records. So the, it, I always feel like it, it seems ridiculous that we have to make this a principle because if you can't review records then how can you actually know what you're reviewing or making decisions on? So, but, we all know that it still needs to be in here because that is not always the case. So the ability to review all records relevant to an investigation in a timely manner, manner is, is essential to providing oversight. Um, it, it allows you to provide um, informed, fact-driven oversight. Um, similarly, um, being able to have access to those who you have questions for. Um, the, and as I mentioned before, all of the elements that went into the decision that someone made after doing an investigation, if you're supposed to review that, you need access to the same materials that they had. Um, now, I realize that there are often um, 
I get a lot of questions around this principle about, well, what about confidentiality? What about state laws? Um, well, of course, everything needs to be done um, in accordance with the law. But there are also lots of agencies who, um, you know, who have board members, commissioners who sign confidentiality agreements um, so that there is so that if they are not upholding that part of this piece, that then there are repercussions for that. But that there are oversight entities all over the country who have unfettered access um, without issue. There, it doesn't seem to be a large uh, drive of oversight practitioners to release information that's deemed confidential. Kevin, just to you know, to flag that this issue of access to records has been an issue for us, and okay. um, uh, and yeah, uh, I think we'll be talking to you about that and how to um, ensure that we do have adequate uh, material. There, there was a complaint that we were asked to investigate and our access to. Uh, some one of the body cam videos at least was denied. Uh, and at least some of us felt it was germane to reviewing the incident. And so it, it became clear that at that, you know, at that point that in our evolving role that we need uh, to figure this out and to memorialize it in a way that allows um, this not to be negotiated for each incident. But so when you say uh, unfettered access to records, you really mean that, right? Mm -hmm. um, just that the oversight body has the ability, to, and, and where does that authority rest with that unfettered access to records? So we see it a couple different ways. So um, in some cases, it's part of the ordinance that creates the oversight entity. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, um, uh, actually New Orleans comes to mind they have an MOU with the police department that outlines how that whole process works. Um, and I, I, always, I always feel like if New Orleans Police Department and their monitor could come to a memorandum of understanding about access, then I, I feel like anybody can do it. Um, but so, and I'm happy to send you a copy of that um, because I, a lot of times it doesn't get outlined in an, in an ordinance, but it is so essential to be able to do the job that you've been asked to do that it, it's not in an ordinance, a memorandum of understanding has to be put into place. Because you're right, I, the amount of time that is, is spent trying to negotiate the process every time, it's a waste of, of your time, it's a waste of law enforcement's time, there just needs to be a process in place um, so that you can, can do the work. And I'm sorry, I think I cut someone off. Um, no, no, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just saying that um, I, that would be super helpful for us to see something like that, because I think it's it's much needed here. At our last meeting, we asked for some um, additional data uh, regarding use of force um, statistics by officer. And, you know, it, we just kind of got like a wishy-washy response when it should have been like, yeah, sure, we'll get you that. Like maybe they'll want to discuss it in an executive session, but to not just say, yes, we can give you that information, which we know is should be out there. Um, could we, um, you know, I'd like to send you the report that we just reviewed uh, with regards to um, data um, that showed um, still some disturbing trends with um, racial disparities in our area. Um, I would love to know what you think and how we can go about having discussions um, with our department about the data and a strategic plan to address some issues. Um, quite frankly, we've been struggling um, to get some type of response to trends that continue, like even through COVID, these trends have continued. Thank you. Absolutely. If I, if I might just, uh, oh, sorry. If I might just say, Jabu, um, we, for all of my fellow commissioners, 
we do our our uh, arrangement with Nicole is that they will give that we have funding for additional consultation around policy and so forth. So I'm actually keeping a list. Uh, and if any of you have things you want to add to that, so for example, an MOU or some kind of mechanism to give us authority to records, uh, your point, Milo, I'll add to the list. So just to let you know that as policy issues, you know, these issues come up and we need further consultation with NACOL, just let me know and I'll add it to the list and we'll, we'll work that out. Thank you. Uh, I know a problem that I've run into a couple times, and it's not in front of me right now, so I can't reference it. But I do know that in the BPOA contract that's been bargained between the city and their and their union, there are some things that are protected in there. And um, like I said, I, not it's not all data things, but I know there are certain data things in there. Uh, would those would that contract have to be renegotiated before they would release that? And yeah, so if so, when we say unfettered access to records, so there are there's a little asterisk there that um, that are allowable um, by um, the the contract that's in place by state laws, by local laws, um, by you know officer bill of rights, things like that. There are lots of things that inhibit that unfettered access that sometimes you cannot control. Um, I think that when, um, I mean, there are contracts that prohibit civilian oversight in some um, cities and um, bringing that attention to that and trying to make sure that in the next round of negotiations that things like that are removed um, is, is just as important as the work that you're doing here. And, and maybe that isn't your role Maybe that are that is the community's role to um, look at things like that that are inhibiting um, true, transparent, accountable mechanisms to oversee the police. Um, so those are important. And unfortunately, until things like that are um, taken out of the mix, they are part of are part of the equation. Yeah, that's kind of the big elephant in the room. With though, I feel like. Oh a lot of things moving forward. I know uh, when our city was tr was trying to uh, strengthen community oversight, that that was that was potentially a big uh, a stumbling block. Um, had, our meet, had, had the mayor not vetoed it and it, had, it moved on, that was a that was a strong concern that um, it wouldn't jive with the current um, uh, CBA contract um, with uh, the department. Okay, well, definitely something to be aware of. And as you're moving forward and as that contract negotiation comes around again to, to look at. Um, hopefully, hopefully, particularly during this time, elected officials are also looking at some of those things that have been put in contracts before um, that perhaps are no longer needed because there, there is the importance um, of building that legitimacy for the community, which means access and transparency. So um, one can hope that this that this moment brings um, that kind of change as well. Any more uh, comments or questions on that? It's a big one, I realize. And if I didn't emphasize it before, it's not just the access, it's the timely access as well. Waiting for months for documents is, um, that you have a right to is um, difficult as well. So um, access to law enforcement executive, executives and internal affairs staff. So um, the effectiveness of an oversight agency can hinge on its ability to effectively communicate with law enforcement officials matter, regarding matters of concern. So being able to have those lines of communication is really important to the work. And I realize that it is often something that takes time to build those lines of communication. I know that um, changes in leadership, changes in policies, can then uh, incidents that happen in the community um, can um, also kind of um, what you might have built up might change, might you might have to start from scratch, but that is always something that needs to be part of the process. Um, 
it is very hard to provide oversight and change to a department that no one's communicating with or one that refuses to communicate with an oversight entity. So it is a two-way street, um, but it is a very important piece to the, um, the process because sustained dialogue promotes cooperation. And in the end, that's, you need cooperation to be able to do the job that you've been given. Well, and that leads us to the next one, full cooperation. Um, so it really needs cooperation, not only um, at the highest levels, but really all officers and department staff um, throughout the course of your work. Um, it's necessary for conducting thorough investigations, obtaining sufficient information, um, and for any work performed by the agency, it, it, such as data analysis, or um, access so you can conduct audits. I mean, all of those things really um, depend on the cooperation of the law enforcement agency being overseen. The next one is sustained stakeholder support. So um, one of the things that oversight entities have really seen as beneficial is to maintain communication with stakeholders, um, that constant outreach is needed to them, to build um, levels of support because oversight entities, um, you want them to know what you're doing. You want them to have clear expectations for the work that you're doing. It's one of the ways that you can show people the independence that you have. Um, and then also uh, what oversight entities, I'll use New Orleans as, as, the, uh, as an example again. Um, they have worked very hard to build stakeholder response. Uh, stakeholder support. And that's not just with members, just community members, community advocacy groups. Your stakeholders include the elected officials, um, you know, members of the school systems. It um, involves, it, law enforcement is one of your stakeholders. It is about having, maintaining relationships and support from all of them so that when things get rough, you have support. So that is something that New Orleans has done a very good job of. Uh, they constantly have um, communication with all stakeholders. And when they came um, under, they were originally under um, another entity, they didn't have independence and they were getting ready to really um, have some of their office and in, uh, independent authority demolished stakeholders came to their support because of the relationships that they had built up and people who knew what they were doing and the good that they can do for the community. So that's very important. Can and it's also, to, yes, tell me. Uh, when you say stakeholders, so I have an idea of what you mean, but can you be more specific? And my, and my guess is that at a certain point in these trainings, we're gonna talk about how to build that rapport with stakeholders. Yes. In fact, we're going to spend quite a bit of time when we do that community and stakeholder engagement piece. We're going to spend, I think, in our third training, um, we're going to spend some time um, with a woman who actually used to be the community ombudsman in um, Denver, um, who worked on community engagement and stakeholder engagement. And she's going to kind of walk through all of those pieces with you. But when we're talking about stakeholders, we are talking about um, you know, members of the community, so of all of the different community groups, um, that, in, that includes also, you know, the, uh, not only the advocacy, advocacy groups, the people who are sitting at the top of those, those groups, but also the people that they represent. It in, includes law enforcement, it includes your city council members, um, so there are lots of, so elected officials, community members, law enforcement are three of the big groups, but there's also, you know, groups that represent people who have been just, that have, um, you know, mothers who've lost children at the hands of police, um, uh, school administration officials. Like there are lots of different other groups that you can kind of pull into that process to let them know what you're doing, your, give them clear expectations of your mandate. Um, and so that's that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about stakeholders. Thanks. Um, and I, I think also a big piece of that sustained stakeholder support is that when there is a, a crisis or a horrible incident in the community, it is politically expedient to support oversight. 
everybody is all on it. I mean, fi- I mean, the whole world saw that in the last nine months. Um, whereas normally it's just a community itself kind of in this bubble sees that. Um, and, but what happens is that what we need to make sure is that once the expediency kind of falls off, what kind of support are you left with and who is going to come and remind people of the reason of your existence? So that's also part of that whole process. Um, Adequate funding and operational resources. So it's also really important that, I mean, when we're talking about some of these models that we talked about and some of the ordinances that I've mentioned and, and the authorities that people have, that requires staff. It requires ongoing training. It requires budgets that actually fund operations that allow an agency to meet its mandate. Um, and it also, you know, there are some cities who have moved to kind of a percentage model where they re- are their budget is a percentage of the police departments. Um, whether that, and in some larger cities, it might be one percent. In some small smaller cities, we see a larger percent because of a kind of to kind of make up for smaller police budgets so they can actually meet the level of demand in their city. So that can be five to 7% in some cities that we've seen. Um, We've also seen, you know, one of the easiest ways to make oversight go away is to stop funding it, to cut its budget. And it tends to be one of um, the first, like right now, and we understand Um, With COVID, many cities, they went right in and went into damage control, and they started cutting all city agency budgets. We have a lot of people who are still on furlough everywhere across the state or across the country. But um, one of the first things that got cut in all oversight agency budgets was training and education um, and travel. So they have no way of, a lot of them are paying for things out of their own pockets right now so that they can get additional training. Um, there are, we've seen with cities um, in the past, uh, Miami is a great example. They cut that budget to almost nothing. Um, and uh, they eventually went to a voter referendum to then be guaranteed a percentage of the Miami Police Department's um, annual budget so that they could actually have enough staff on board to do the job that they were mandated to do. So it's very important to have the budget um, and operational resources needed. The next is public reporting and transparency. I cannot emphasize how important this is. Those annual reports um, allow a look into the work, not only of the oversight agency, but things that are happening in the police department. So it's not just number of complaints, um, uh, number of instances of use of force. I mean, it's also what kind of recommendations were made, um, what was found and what kind of audits were done. It just kind of depends on what the oversight agency, what their authorities are to what you report. But the more information that you can give the public, the better. Um, and of course, there's always a lot of concern about uh, well, well, we can't put too much information in there because of confidentiality. We're not talking about outlining every complaint with every officer's name. We're talking about giving statistics so that police, so that the the general public, um, and I like to say the broader community, because I also think it's important for for law enforcement to see these these numbers, to see um, how many complaints, how many are sustained, um, how many community outreach events are doing or is an agency doing? Um, what are the the responses to recommendations that are made by by law enforcement? All of that can be made public, and it really makes a big difference in the uh, time that it takes to build that legitimacy piece. Because I'm I'm not sure how you build legitimacy if no one knows what you're doing. So it's very important. And we also will spend some more time on that piece as well, what goes into effective reporting. Um, next we have, um, well, before we, lo- we move on from the reporting, I also wanna say special reports are also um, a really good thing to consider. So if you have a, um, like for instance, there are a lot of agencies that did special reports on, on the police response to protests last summer. Um, and that 
really gave a look into um, the type of complaints that, that came out of them, um, some issues that they saw with the police response and some recommendations for changes. Um, so that's a good example. Also follow-up reports are to your reports are also important. So like the, um, the inspector general in New York uh, for the New York police department um, did a, a, a review of use of force reporting practices. And they made a ton of recommendations. So, um, one can uh, hope for that change. This, this, this moment and brings um, that they, kind of change as well. The, the department accepted those. They implemented more the uh, comments they or questions on that. follow up report it's so that they could look at the impact those changes actually had. So, um, and, and once they put in the recommendations, were people actually following them? Is there additional training needed? So it's not just kind of a one and done, it's it, there needs to be follow up. To that. Kimmy, could I ask a quick question? Yeah. So, uh, when you say these reports were done, for example, they were uh, the oversight boards had the resources to hire someone or have a staff person. They weren't relying on, on the uh, police department to do the report, but rather it was an arm's length report. Um, it was most, almost all of them that I have seen were arm's length. But I will say, and, and that's mostly because I focus on the civilian oversight reports that are coming out. I will say, um, and I haven't read it from cover to cover, but there were some police departments um, like Dallas um, who did a report on the protests that was actually, they were very critical of themselves and made recommendations for how they could do it better next time. So those also are coming out of law enforcement agencies as well. But Dallas is the only one I've actually seen at this point. So Could you, uh, when you get a chance, can you send us the uh, special report on use of force reporting? Absolutely. Uh, I would will. be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, just because I, I, I can send you a, a list, but also um, uh, New York City and, um, and Denver, uh, they are two of many cities that did reports, but they did two very extensive reports um, on the protest follow-up. So you can just see kind of what went into that systemic review and what kind of recommendations came out of it. Um, next, uh, I wanna talk about, I'm actually gonna talk about community outreach and community involvement together because it's really about the output and the input. So it's very important to continually have engagement with your community. And like I said before, we're gonna go into the the nitty gritty of that in a later session, but you know you need to be able um, you need to be able to talk with the community and let them know. Otherwise, it, it's very difficult to have effective civilian oversight. It's where you build relationships. It's where you recruit volunteers. It's where you improve uh, relationships, build coalitions, and develop a greater capacity for problem solving. And when I talk about recruit volunteers, I, I just want to uh, mention um, one of the things that comes to mind always when I say that is there are some oversight entities who have what they call community ambassadors, who they work with members of the community to let them to talk to them, they let them know what they're doing, and then that person um, can go and tell the community members that they work with um, about the agency. They can also tell them how to file complaints. So it amplifies, it's a way to amplify your voice. Um, and I, it, it's, um, Atlanta has a very good program of community ambassadors. And so um, that's definitely one to, to look at when you're modeling. But the community, community input piece is important too. Um, you know, you need to find out, you need to get input regarding um, how, how oversight should function, um, which accountability issues you should be looking at. Um, what, what is the best fit for your community um, to meet its needs? And there's that word again, expectations. So it's very important um, to not only have the output um, and the talking, but also the listening. Um, uh, one community that I talk about a lot because I, this seems so simple and, uh, but so many 
don't do it this way is that when they have a community meeting, well, first, first they'll say, how many of you have gone to a community meeting where you're sitting in maybe a church and there is a, a stage at the top in the basement and all of the members of, you know, you've got law enforcement, you've got an oversight official, you've got maybe an elected official sitting up there and the community's all sitting in the, the seats down below. Well, in the community I'm talking about, they have a podium at the front, but everybody is sitting in the audience. There's no panel of experts. Now, law enforcement, oversight, elected officials, they all get up and talk, but then they do it the same way that the community members do after them. Everybody gets a chance to walk up to the, the microphone like everybody else and say their piece. And it makes a tremendous difference in how people react to people who are speaking. It's really where you're putting people on the same level. And it's just amazing how, I mean, I, I, I would like as, well, I realize I'm sitting here just talking at you for two hours, but how amazing that is to have that interaction um, with community in that kind of way. Um, Next, I want to talk about confidentiality, anonymity, and protection from retaliation. So we did talk about this a little bit at the very beginning. So oversight should function with the same integrity, professionalism, and ethical standards that it expects from law enforcement. So um, you need to be protecting sensitive information as well as those who disclose it. Um, and all of that goes into the legitimacy piece. Um, and it also just goes into the building trust piece, honestly. Um, oversight can't function when there's someone that is not following those, the confidentiality and anonymity agreements. Um, in fact, it will ruin the reputation of an oversight entity. Um, and even if it is one person acting alone, I think all of you know that then that becomes the oversight entity's uh, issue and not just that one person's issue. Um, also, um, there needs to be a level of respect um, and for those who are filing um, agreements or filing complaints, there needs to be um, respect for confidentiality agreements um, and maintaining, maintaining anonymity of those who um, have the courage to come in and file complaints. Um, and I also, I, I don't know, I didn't see it in the policy when I was reading, and, but perhaps I missed it. A lot of oversight agencies have also become a place where officers can make complaints as well. And that also is very important that their anonymity, that their, the confidentiality piece are all applied equally to officers who come forward to make complaints. And lastly, I'm going to talk about procedural justice and legitimacy very briefly because I feel like I've talked about this, I don't know, for an hour and a half So, um, to you throughout. So um, it should, should serve as the core principle that guides the work um, and processes of the Civilian Oversight Agency. Um, typically, um, procedural justice centers on how authorities exercise, as we talked about before. And, you know, research has shown that procedural just um, interactions between law enforcement and the community positively impact the, the public's um, compliance with laws and their willingness to assist in crime efforts or crime control efforts. Um, but at the same time, um, we are seeing that people trust the oversight process more. Um, that they are more satisfied with the, com the complaint process when it is also seen as procedurally just. So it's it's important to to um, apply those principles not only in policing but also in oversight. So before I move on from the principles, are there any more questions? Okay. So next. I just want to talk a little bit about framework for effective practices and oversight. Um, a lot of times what we see is, or what we hear is people are like, well, what are the best practices? Um, how, how do we make sure that what we're doing is what we actually should be doing? Well, so um, 
and it's natural to know want to know what works what doesn't work um and and really this has been the, the term best practices um is a term that's been used for decades trying to define what oversight entities should should do but there's some limitations in in using best practices and because of those limitations it's led us to move from a best practices or best fit approach to an effective practices approach based on the 13 principles that we just went over and serves as a foundation for effective and sustainable oversight. Um, the form that oversight takes um, in a community needs to be possible, feasible, and congruent with the community expectations. Um, and then also the the best form of oversight actually depends on the circumstances of the community that it's being implemented in. So all of those things make it very difficult um, to talk about best and why we've moved on to effective. Um, so the limitations of best, um, best practices. So it really boils down to um, there are a lot of complexities in civilian oversight. And so that makes it very difficult to, um, to really um, talk about what uh, practices should be uh, implemented to be what are successful practices. Um, it also is very difficult in how do we pick up the best practices that are being used in Indianapolis and move them to Vermont or Burlington or vice versa? Um, how do we determine what's working in New York City where you have an agency with over 100 employees and 35,000 law enforcement officers and apply it to Kansas City, Missouri? Um, so it becomes very difficult to measure. There are a lot of academics out there who are very frustrated by civilian oversight because of its difficulty to measure overall best practices. Although I will say, say in the last couple of years, we're seeing more and more um, where they're taking, they're looking at pieces of it. Um, for instance, uh, subpoena power and what that looks like, or um, the, the, there's a lot of, of, or more examples of that than we have seen in the past. Um, the goals of civilian oversight don't necessarily lend themselves to comparative measurement. Um, there's a lack of standardized definitions in civilian oversight, which I will say we're working on. Um, standards in general are something that we're working on, but what makes that even difficult is that that comment that I made earlier that no two civilian oversight agencies are exactly alike and there's no standardization of what data is being collected in each agency. So that makes it very difficult. <clears throat> so that leads us to talk about this effective practices framework. Um, so it's still possible to use alternative approaches so that we can have some practical guidance on, on what uh, civilian oversight should look like. So it's a really important to remember that in civilian oversight, there are several possibilities or paths to success. So just because you're in a jurisdiction that's not doing one thing, that doesn't mean you can't be successful, but there are some effective practices that you need to consider because for effectiveness and sustainability. Um, the development of oversight has to allow for some flexibility, um, but take into consider consideration the criteria that is understood to be crucial to su uh, successful oversight. And that's really where those 13 principles come in. And when we're talking about the 13 principles, being able to have all of those 13 principles fully in force would be amazing. But we also know that there's some realities that make that not happen. Um, and so it's about looking at them and making sure how do we, what are our levels in our community is what are our priorities of these 13 principles um, where we can have implement them all and have them all under consideration. But are we, is it more important to be independent? Um, maybe our independence is here instead of up here. Um, but do we have enough funding to make sure that we can do uh, what we've been asked to do. So all of those things have to be considered um, as we're working. And, and the best part is, is that you have lots of examples of how civilian oversight is working in other communities effectively. 
And so that's kind of how we eventually have brought um, in a list of effective practices that we hope everyone's able to employ um, because we've seen them work, seen them work in other communities. Um, and, and it's not just about looking at a study um, about, you know, X number, like if, if you have subpoena power, then this is what happens and this is this is a measure of, of effectiveness. Um, it's about looking and valuing the perspectives of a diverse group of stakeholders um, to see what is working and what's not working. And I will say, even some of the, the agencies that we would deem very effective, if you were to talk to them, there wouldn't be something that they wouldn't say, yes, but this is something that we're lacking that would help us in our work. That's why you see agencies um, like Denver, like Berkeley, California, go in and make and ask for changes to their ordinance um, so that they can effect, operate more effectively. Even though they had some very effective practices to start with, there was definitely room for improvement and they sought it and they got it. So when we're making recommendations, um, for effective practices, we look at, is this practice an appropriate fit for our local context? Not all recommended practices will be appropriate for every over, oversight jurisdiction or oversight system. Um, recommendations under consideration need to be discussed with local state stakeholders and gather feedback. None of these decisions of implementing practices should be made in a vacuum. There needs to be community input and stakeholder input as a whole as part of that process. You also need to look at how will this practice strengthen civilian oversight in relation to the 13 principles of effective oversight. Um, evaluate the strengths and weaknesses in relation to the principles. Um, does adopting a particular recommendation achieve its intended outcome in their jurisdiction? Um, does, it, does it cause any unintended consequences in the jurisdiction? Um, it may, implementation might strengthen a principle in one area, but it may not sufficiently address a, a particular weakness or other related issue or shortcoming of the agency. So it's really important to look at it holistically when you're implementing any practice. Um, and, it, and it also, that becomes very important when you're looking at negotiating different authorities that you want added, um, kind of looking at how they all interact. Um, and what those outcomes might be. And then again, I mentioned earlier, looking at the unintended consequences of implementing a practice. Um, what are the potential consequences? And while practice may strengthen the oversight system in one area, some may have unintended consequences of undermining the oversight system in another. For example, um, the, the implementation of cert certain practices could have significant impacts um, on the existing or proposed resources of the agency. If you have, um, you want to have more access to data, but your, your, your budget is a certain level, your um, staff is a certain level, will you really be able to handle the additional um, uh, mandates that you're asking for by being able to, to look at data and make recommendations and do additional reports and do audits? Like what, all of those things have to be considered. So um, I realized that I've almost run up to the, the time, but um, that is the end of my slideshow. I'm gonna, Stephanie, I know I sent you the, the slide deck. I'm gonna make a couple changes to it <laughs> since we found a couple errors in it as we were going through. Um, and then I'll resend that so you all have a copy of the slides. Um, and in that copy is also my email in case there are any of you that don't have it so that if you have any follow-up questions, we're always available. Um, I want to make sure that there's um, a clear understanding of all of the information as you move forward. That's what we're here for. So with that, I want to turn it back over to all of you to see if there are any additional questions before we close out for the evening. Kimmy, I'd like to ask um, a question that has come up in discussions here. And one of the arguments that has been made has been that um, Community members and civilians don't really are not experts, and therefore uh, 
don't really have the expertise to weigh in on law enforcement matters. And so I just wonder if you could talk about that, talk about what kind of training other civilian oversight boards do have, um, and, and your thoughts about that. Well, I will say that is the number one argument against civilian oversight in every community when it comes up, um, or even you know, 20 years down the line, it still raises its its head. Um, you know, the how how can anyone who doesn't do my job tell me how I should be doing my job or know how I should be doing my job? So one of the ways that that's remedied is that training is really important. So there's the training that you're getting from us that kind of is going to talk to you about, you know, civilian oversight, how to do some of the mandates you're given. Um, a little bit about some mandates that might be important down the line. Um, so there is that. But there is also other training. Training from the law enforcement agency is also considered very important. Um, and working with them, you know, if you see a lot of uh, cases that come through about use of force, having training from the department to thoroughly understand how officers are trained um, on the use of force policies um, is, is really important uh, to learn about traffic stops. There, I mean, the list is long of things and that doesn't all have to happen all at once. I know that for instance, in Indianapolis, um, the requirements are 20 hours of training a year from the police department um, and 16 hours of ride-alongs with officers um, at, at a minimum. And, and that that's to be done every year by every um, member of, of the board. Not only does that help um, you understand the training that officers are also receiving, um, but it also goes a long way because I have to tell you, being able to sit in a car for a shift with an officer and have conversations allowed me to understand where they were coming from. It also allowed them to understand civilian oversight because before I get in the car, I'm, I'm the big bad wolf. I am someone that's coming to wreck um, their career or, and that I don't understand policing at all. Um, but being able to sit in the car as two human beings um, goes a long way for building those relationships and understanding. Um, so there's a, a side benefit to the training as well. So that's, and then, then there's also, you know, learning from prosecutors and public defenders and academics who are doing research. There's so much training that can be done out there um, to really give you a holistic view of the tasks at hand and, and, and the work that police officers do. Um, so that's, those are some of the starts um, or starting places. And I will say, there are some that you will never be able to change their mind about that. So it's about getting the training and then doing the work in a way. And then it's kind of building that trust with them that, you know, that you are not there to be anti-police, that you are there to build a better community, which involves everyone. Um, and also once the community trusts the police more, um, it makes their job easier when they're working with a community that actually trusts um, them and sees them as legitimate as an entity, so. Thanks, that was great, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Penny, I don't yes. have one for you, but I do wanna respond. I know there's someone, um, I think we should explain to folks who watch this or who are watching what kind of participation folks can have going forward in these meetings. And we as a commission, I think, decided that one of our previous meetings, it might have been with the Joint Committee, and please correct me if I'm wrong, anyone. I think we the reason we did that half an hour at the beginning was to give folks the opportunity to provide public comment and made the decision that we didn't think it would work to open up um, discussion during the training to the public because of the volume of people we sometimes having call in, we didn't think we could get through the training. Am I mistaken, um, Jabu, Stephanie, or Milo about that? That that's why we designed it this way? No, uh, you're correct. Okay, because I don't want folks to think we didn't want to hear from them, but it just, I don't, and I don't know, Cami, if you feel differently about how we set this up, but we tried to do it so we could you know, actually get the eight hours 
No, I, I think I, I, I agree with the way that you did it. Um, I will add that for members of the community who are watching, um, you know, we are not a resource just for people who are practicing oversight. Um, that um, there is a lot of information on our website. Um, and there's also some trainings on basic civilian oversight that are um, on the website as well under our resources section. So we want to make sure that everybody has the, the, the knowledge that they need um, to be part of the conversation. Um, and that extends to the everyone in the community as well. So if there are questions from the community, there's also ways to contact us on the website. So if in the next public um, forum where they're able to ask questions, if they don't want to wait and they have a very specific question that we're also available to answer those questions um, really at any time. Great, thank you so much. Of course. Well, before we close out, I just want to say I thank you very much for hanging in there with me this evening. It's been a pleasure being with all of you. And I'm looking forward to talking all about investigations <laughs> um, on uh, June 10th. So, um, and in the meantime, I, I have a list of things here uh, to provide you, um, to give you some resources to, to look at between now and then. And if for some reason I've missed something on that list, just let me know, I'm happy to help. Kimmy, uh, I wanna thank you so much. I, I For me, this was, I, even though I've been reading a lot, this was really helpful. It stimulated a lot of ideas. And um, I wanted to say that if you want to give us homework for uh, something to read before the next training, uh, if that would be helpful, that I, I'd be open to it. Uh, and uh, just to thank you, this was really, really helpful. Really learned a lot. Absolutely. And I, I, I maybe when I send those... Oh, I'm sorry, Milo. I was just going to oh, say, I'm when I send those links, I'll just uh, maybe include a thing or two that might be of interest to all of you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. I just wanted to um, just say the same thing. Um, I, I do a lot of reading, but uh, the, you've brought up a lot of things for us to think about, things that we definitely need. Um, I really appreciate that and look forward to the future ones. Co uh, Councillor Paul? Um, sounds to me like you don't go by Cameron. Sounds like everybody's calling you something else. Yes, Cammy is, is, well, I'll answer to both, but Cammy's more common, yes. Well, I apologize. I, um, I had a neighborhood meeting. We um, uh, had a neighborhood meeting on homelessness this evening. I thought that it would be done by around 6.15 and 6.15 led to 7 o'clock, which led to 7.15. So I apologize. I wish that I had been here at 6 o'clock. Um, after, um, uh, given all of the things that have gone on uh, over the past year and a half, NACOL has certainly been a uh, um, an acronym that uh, we have all come to know. And I will say I didn't know a whole lot about it for a couple of years ago, but know a little bit more about it now. And uh, Thank you so much for your time. Um, and thanks to the police commission for putting this out there for city councilors to attend. And uh, I see a number of people um, from the public that are here, um, a number of people who want to serve on the police commission, which I think is great that they are here and listening. And um, well, I'm gr grateful that you're, sh that you're gonna be sharing the slide deck so that I will be able to see what I missed. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll We'll certainly endeavor to be on time for the next one. So again, thank you very much. And thanks for being here. Uh, just I'll, one last. I'll thing. jump in and say that. Oh, sorry, I was going to jump in and say that we also recorded this entire meeting. Um, so we'll be we'll absolutely share with you, uh, Councillor Paul. Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll, oops. Sorry. <laughs> oh no. Go ahead. Say, Go ahead. I was going to say a, um, like a motion to adjourn. Certainly. Um, so, uh, sorry, were you making the motion or asking for the motion? I was going to ask if you would like a motion to adjourn. Abs uh, if Cami, if you are all set, then absolutely. I am. Thank you. Awesome. Oh. Uh, we'll see you Jan uh, June tenth. Then. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
So I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second, second that motion. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Thanks, all Bill. in favor of, of adjourning the meeting, raise your hand to say aye. 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 That passes unanimously at 8.03 p.m. Thank you, everybody in the public that joined in, and we'll see you at the next training session, June 10th, uh, starting at 5.30 p.m. Till then, stay safe. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks.